you know, it's tough to win when, especially when one of your max contract guys is, um, doesn't want to be a part of the team. With that being said, we were lucky enough to get James Harden in that trade, who's dialed in and, and wants to be here and wants to win. Hey, what's up, y'all? Welcome to the Players Platform for VVM Sports. I'm Mike Hill, joined by Philadelphia 76ers Power Forward, my man, George Niang, the minivan. We're going to talk about that nickname in just a little bit. But let's talk about this team right now. This is the Philadelphia 76ers team that's right up there in the mix in the Eastern Conference after years of talking about, will this finally be the year for the 76ers? Will this finally get it done? What gives you the confidence that this year will be that year that Philadelphia takes that next step? Um, you know, I, I think we have a lot of continuity with our roster. You know, we, we've had pretty much the same roster since training camp. So we've had an opportunity to build uh, day in and day out uh, with the same guys. And I think that's huge, whether that's building chemistry, that's building trust um, over the course of the year. Uh, I'm confident moving forward that, you know, uh, we have guys in our locker room that are just focused on winning. There's no personal accolades that outweigh the team. And, and that's huge, especially in professional sports. Um, you know, I think this is the most locked in team that I've been in, whether it's lifting after games or getting in uh, on off days and getting extra work. And this team is locked in on continuously growing on an upward trend. I don't want to put anything in words in your mouth, but you brought it up like there, there's this seems like more of a team. I pick up on certain things like that. So there are people that were in the locker room last year, players in the locker room last year, and maybe the years prior to that, that were about themselves. You feel like you've gotten rid of some of those players? Uh, yeah. You know, I think the biggest thing for us is that we have all guys that want to be here. I mean, there's no secret to the matter of fact that last year we had, you know, uh, Ben didn't want to be here and he made that known. Um, and I've voiced it um, plenty of times, I feel like. Um, and with that being said, you know, it's tough to win, when, especially when one of your max contract guys is um, doesn't want to be a part of the team. With that being said, we were lucky enough to get James Harden in that trade, who's dialed in and, and wants to be here and wants to win. And um, if you've watched him this season, I mean, to literally go from someone that, you know, has averaged 30 points in his career to being someone that can get to 15 plus assists on any given night, I think he averages like 11 assists or 10 assists. It, I mean, it's remarkable the way he's kind of transitioned his game to just make the team that much better. Um, for me, it's been a joy to play alongside with him um, and just to learn from him, his competitive nature and uh, what it takes to be great day in and day out. Um, like I said, uh, I'm super thankful this year that we have guys that, you know, want to be in this locker room and want to continue to uh, push forward and see the team be great. And you're a good player in your own right, but what's what's it mean to you? Like not just yourself, but the other players when you see like guys like James Harden or even even Joel Embiid, who's having an MVP type season, kind of make those sacrifices, pull back, and not make it about them their individual stats themselves, and and care more about the team. These superstar players who get all of the accolades and all of the attention, but once again put everything that they can back into the team to make everybody great. Yeah, I mean that's huge when you have your two best guys. Uh, doing stuff like that. It makes you look yourself in the mirror and be like, well, if these guys are sacrificing to make the team better, um, what do I need to sacrifice? I should never think about myself um, over the team ever if the two best players are doing that. So when you have a culture like that, um, you know, that's huge uh, moving forward. You know, you just have people that are all dialed in and every single one of their actions day in and day out is how can I get the team better? And it starts from the top. And those guys do a great job of doing that. They do a great job of holding us accountable. But the, I think the best thing is they also let others, you know, talk to them, whether, you know, if they're, you know, slacking or, you know, messing up on an assignment, you know, other people can tell them and they are actually willing to be coached. And that's huge, um, especially in professional sports. How much pressure is on you guys this year, man? I'm, I'm just, let's just keep it real. Let's leave, when we keep it 1000 a buck right now. It's always pressure playing in Philadelphia. The fans are going to let you hear about it night in and night out. You can go on a 10-game winning streak and then lose two in a row, and it's almost like, you guys suck. You guys are terrible. This year, with everything that you're doing, you're talking about the Bostons of the world having a good season, Milwaukee having another good season. It's the top three. How much pressure right now is on you guys to get it done this year with what you're um, You know, at the end of the day, I think, you know, the best thing about us right now is I'd say maybe like last year, you kind of like feel that, you know, you make a big blockbuster trade at the trade deadline and, you know, you're, they're like, all right, this is the time, you know, 
you make it happen. Um, but I think the best thing about being in Philadelphia is that you know that they care. Um, mm -hmm. So you either look at it as it's pressure or you can look at it as a, like, um, I got to commit to being the best me, you know, every single day. Um, and that's kind of how I look at it from a team aspect. You know, I'm sure it looks like, you know, there is pressure, but uh, I think for us is we're enjoying the fact that we're continuously getting better and finding things out about ourselves of what we need to continue to do to grow and be better. Um, you know, we've had countless games against top teams in the Western Conference and the Eastern Conference where, you know, we've won and then we've lost. But I think, you know, we've come out learning like, all right, these are the ways we can attack these different teams and be successful. What people have to understand is in the playoffs is you got to give yourself a fighting chance. Uh, mm -hmm. Look at Milwaukee a couple of years ago. They're literally two inches with KD's foot away from going home and, and not winning a championship. So if you can go in and be committed and be focused and be as a team and have the least amount of distractions, you're giving yourself a fighting chance. And I think we've learned that, you know, moving forward, especially after last year, you know, that you just want to come in, be healthy, um, and minimalize distractions and, and be together to give yourself a fighting chance because in the playoffs anything can happen yeah it's like you said it's a matter of inches kd's uh foot now being being behind that line because it could have just derailed that whole situation you guys uh, with toronto i know you went there with philadelphia years ago with toronto and that shot by Kawhi. all those types of things that happen in the playoffs so you got to give yourselves a fighting chance and not leave room, any room for any error but talking about the pressure like it just the fact that you're in philadelphia right now with the teams and the success that you saw the Eagles going to the Super Bowl, yeah. you saw the Philadelphia Phillies going to the World Series. Now it's like our fans telling you guys, hey, 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 you're up next. Yeah, like you better get it or we'll chase you guys out of town. No. <laughs> um, yeah, I, you know, Philly's real supportive, but obviously when you're not, you know, winning uh, or, or getting to that level, they're going to be frustrated, which I completely understand. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so at the end of the day, you hear, you know, fans with their opinions and and what they expect uh, and at the end of the day I, I've I've I can appreciate it I love it because it means they actually care and um but I, I think for the, the the best thing for everybody's well-being is is control the controllables and like I was talking about before yes it may seem like a lot of pressure but when you start thinking like it's pressure you're gonna go out there and not play like yourself so I think all of us realize that and, and try to stay away from feeling that pressure because then you're not going to be able to be you. I, all I can control is my attitude, my effort, and how I treat other people. And uh, I know it sounds cliche, and that's definitely the, is not the Philadelphia motto. Like, mm -hmm. I'm going to give my best. It's, no, we want you to win. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, I think we're, we're going to get out there. And uh, we're going to turn a lot of heads, you know, when we get into the I, I, I love Philly fans, man. I, I, I'm i from New York. And this is grimy, gritty type, you know, what, win at all costs, whatnot. They can be a little boisterous. I think sometimes it can be a little arrogant. That's just me saying that. I'm not saying you're saying that. But at the same time, like when you talk about booing Santa Claus and all that type of stuff, booing, how can you boo Beyonce? They booed Beyonce and Destiny's Child, bro. You cannot do that. I know Stanley wore a Laker jersey, but you cannot do that no matter what. It's just, it's just like sacrilegious right there. But when you're talking about the fans, man, they can also be really funny. So tell me, like, the funniest thing you heard out of the crowd, either directed to you or a teammate, or the most, like, almost scary thing that you heard from a Philadelphia fan? Um, you know, it was actually uh, one of the first preseason games that I got here. It was my first preseason game at home. Uh, I don't know if it was Toronto or Atlanta. I forget who it was, but I had a chance to, you know, shoot the ball and I pump fake past it and uh, got tipped out of bounds in the other team's ball. And some guy in, you know, street clothes with his sunglasses on, I was like, yo, what the heck? We brought you here to shoot the ball. So shoot the damn ball. <laughs> and I just usually I don't even engage with like fans but it was a preseason game there weren't many people in there and I was like all right I got you and then in my head I'm like why did I even just respond but then I'm like this is Philadelphia like they're not gonna hold back they're gonna uh tell you how you feel um but then you have like the the great ones like um you know there's there's plenty of celebrities you know sitting courtside whether it's Meek Mill you know uh Michael Blackston um mm. all of the Eagles guys that show love um, so that, that's great to have that support in a, you know, in a sports town, but, uh, even, you know, a, a couple games, you know, I've seen, there's a guy that, uh, you know, has like written in, in marker on his chest that says like bang, bang, me cause that's what our, uh, our announcer Kate Scott says every time that I hit a three. So, 
as much as people want to sit and, you know, say that Philly fans are critical, if you win here, they'll love you forever. So that's what keeps me going is like, a, if I can get a championship to, to, or be a part of a championship in Philadelphia, I might be on Broad Street for, for four weeks straight. Oh, yeah, you definitely be legendary status because you're definitely helping them get there, man. And you got a guy who I thought probably should have won the MVP a couple of years ago, but I definitely think he is the front runner to win the MVP this year. I'm talking about Joel Embiid. Tell me the reason why, and I'm pretty sure, not a biased opinion because I think a lot of people feel this way. Why should he be the most valuable player outside of stats this year? What are you seeing that other people don't see that makes him the most valuable player? Yeah, I mean, I just think about how dominant he is. I mean, when you have a guy out there that literally forces a whole defense to stay in the paint um, and continue, I mean, you said not to bring up stats, but can continue to average 30 plus points. Like, come on. I mean, we're talking about, you know, James Harden won MVP and he was averaging 30 plus points. You know, uh, Michael Jordan, um, you know, you look at his career average, it's 30 points and he's won. Uh, multiple uh, MVPs you know you, you just look at how dominant someone is in the game and to literally have um, every defense throw everything at you whether it's double teams triple teams the whole team and you're still able to produce like that at that size as a center I mean I think that speaks for itself um, you know I don't want to harp too much on it because then it feels like we're begging and I feel like you kind of get scrutinized for that mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, I know Joel's worth. He's my MVP. Um, you know, it's about damn time other people start realizing. And, 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 and what he does on the defensive end as well. I mean, I don't think a lot of people give a lot enough credit for what he does on both ends of the court, taking nothing away from Nikola Jokic, who's had an outstanding season once again. But people have even brought up race. You know, that's been a big issue among media members now, back and forth, you know, as a player. And just be real, you, you know, you can answer the way you want to, but – do you believe that because a lot of the media members who are voting for these MVP, that is part of the conversation or maybe not at all? What do you feel? Um, you know, I don't like to think, you know, uh, that negatively. Obviously, I know Kendrick Perkins, um, you know, had brought that up. Um, you know, I like to see the good in everybody. And I like to think that, you know, sports is something, whether if it's color, race, uh, what people look like, it's the commonality of the game that we all love and appreciate and that the people that are voting on this award um, take that into account and don't take race. They take the love and the actuality of the game into this award. Uh, so I don't even, that thought doesn't even come through my mind. Um, obviously people have opinions and uh, Nikola Jokic is a great player. There's nobody that's saying that he doesn't deserve the MVP, but I know Joel Embiid also deserves an MVP. So uh, I'll leave it at that. Um, you know, I know there's the, the purity, you know, of the game with, uh, with those voters um, and they get a vote and they have the last choice. And, you know, I, I hope they make the right choice and, and give Joel the MVP. Well, you, hopefully he wins the MVP this year. A lot of people feel like he should. Of course, you talked about James Harden and the MVP award he won uh, back in the day as well. And now he's on your team, making some sacrifices, doing some great things. I, I, do you remember James Harden without the beard? Just by the way, just off the off, I don't, I don't remember James. I can't remember what he looks like without the beard. Do you remember? I remember like small stints in like Arizona State and then OKC a little bit. But clearly I remember him in Houston uh, with the beard. So I can't say that I... I I don't remember him. Yeah. So to answer your question, no, I, I don't. What was that like a person in, in person? You see, you ever just like when like, man, do you can't eat soup with that? I'm like, what, what, you, you ever tell him about this, the care of it? What, what, what is that like? Uh, I don't know. It's his stick, though. Like it makes him him, you know, and, and I think it's unique because nobody else in the league really has that, you know, image, you know, like he has the beard is him. They call him the beard. Yeah. Uh, so, and you know, he's had a legacy with that name. Um, he's had a lot of success on and off the court, you know, with, with his branding, what he does um, off the court, and then with, you know, who he is on the court. And it just makes him him. I, I don't think it's ever brought up. I think he's probably heard every single joke in the book about it. Uh, so he just kind of laughs it off and it just makes him him. I mean, people, you know, have their thoughts about James, but to be honest with you, um after playing alongside him for a year and a half now um probably one of the you know greatest guys you know um to be around 
you know, just with how unselfish he is, especially, you know, with his teammates, whether, you know, it's giving off the court or, you know, changing his game so that everybody can get shots around him and making the right play while he's on the court. I mean, this guy was a scoring champ and, yeah. and he's sacrificing that to make other people better. Um, I think it just speaks volumes to him and what's important to him and that's winning. Yeah. And, 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 you know, and hopefully doing it in the playoffs, you know, a lot of people will talk about and they harp on, they'll say, the Sixers probably won't do it again this year. This is what a lot of people hear. You know, I'm pretty sure you hear the same things because, okay, it's one thing to do in the regular season. Can James Harden do it in the postseason? And that's been a knock on him in the postseason about uh, him showing up or not showing up in the postseason. What tells you that this year will be different and he's going to be able to shut some of those critics up? I mean, you, you think about everything that's happened, uh, you know, COVID. I mean, he was injured. He was playing on one leg in Brooklyn. He gets traded here in the midst of that. Um, didn't have much time to work with us. I'm not sitting here making excuses, but it's easy for people to sit on the couch and critique uh, one of the greatest to ever uh, play the game. Um, with that being said, uh, you know what I think is the best thing about James is that through all the criticism, through all the failures, through all the successes, is that guy comes in every day and he works. And I know one thing in life that equals success or is a recipe to success are people that continue to keep their head down and continue to work. And uh, he's a tireless worker. Uh, like I said, whether if it's lifting after games, lifting before games, getting work in on off days, um, he's constantly trying to perfect his craft. Um, and I believe in that. And I'm a firm believer in someone that's going to continue to perfect his craft. And James continues to do that day in and day out. And I've seen it with my own two eyes. So people that don't see that can easily say, um, you know, that this or that, but uh, I'm a firm believer and I trust in the work that he's put in and I can't wait to see what it leads up to uh, this year in the playoffs. So in other words, he's no Ben Simmons. Is that what you're trying to? Like, <laughs> oh man, Mike, you are, you are <laughs> great. You are great. Um, you know, one of them is playing and one of them is not. So. What did you, what did you do when you heard the news that he's out for the season, that he's, he's, he's not, you know, is, what did you hear? What did you, what did you think? Did you? Um, you know, I mean, I haven't really paid much attention to Brooklyn considering, you know, that, uh, you know, we have our own fight, uh, you know, to, to figure out. And uh, we played them a couple of times with their new new team and, um, you know, with, uh, with their old team. And um, I, I think the biggest thing is you just have to focus on yourself. Uh, mm. What he has going on is what he has going on. Um, obviously, you know, I'm thankful that, you know, we're on the up and up and, and we're working with the guys that we have. Uh, but if it is an injury, that's unfortunate because, um, you know, sports do take a grueling toll on your body. And um, I hope that he can get healthy. Um, but at the end of the day, like it is what it is, you know. Mm -hmm. All right. Let's talk more positive. Man. I want to talk more about you because, uh, you know, like you said, that not just the fans are telling you to shoot the ball more like Ben, uh, it, not Ben, but uh, James Harden has even encouraged you to shoot the ball a little bit more. Uh, Sent three point shooter. You are a knockdown shooter. I mean, you can score. You can do your thing, man. Uh, how do you envision yourself? You know, do you ever allow yourself to dream? So to speak, we know that Joel Embiid is going to get his. We know that James Harden is going to do his thing. We know Tobias Harris is going to step up here and there or whatever. How do you envision yourself? you ever allow yourself to dream that, you know, you're in the NBA finals in these, you know, one or two of these games and these critical games in the finals that George Niang is the one that kind of carries Philadelphia 76ers over the top. Do you ever envision yourself doing that? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, you know, I think you have to dream like that, right? You have to have goals and expectations to, for you to be the best, you know, that saying where, what is it? You shoot for the stars, you, you land on the moon, you know, um, but at the same time, I understand my role on this team. Um, and I understand that me being great in the things that I do and, and being good in my role allows for other people to be great in their role. There's no just one player that gets to take every piece of the pie. There's a certain pieces that you have to fit into that allows everybody else to be great into their piece, which allows for a masterful piece, right? And, you know, and that's what creates a team. And I think some guys get confused where they're like, well, this person gets all the glory and da, 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 da. But at the end of the day, the only thing that should matter is winning. And, um, you know, I've heard numerous stories of people that have 
uh, championships, and they say that it's the greatest feeling. And uh, I think every every NBA present NBA player is fighting for that feeling to feel what it's like to be on top of the world for that year and to be called a champ for the rest of your life. Yeah, there are a lot of uh, great players, uh, some iconic players who never won a championship, and I'm pretty sure they'd give that up for the role of just winning a championship once or twice or whatnot. You see some guys that play that, that 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 key role and maybe not weren't stars that won championships and they still have that glory right there. Uh, and you got a guy and, and Doc Rivers, I'm going to get back to you in a second, but Doc Rivers, who uh, who won a championship in Boston, well, what is he telling you about this run and the importance of this? And sometimes can you actually understand what he's saying? You know, don't you want to throw a cough drop in, in Doc's mouth sometime because of the, the horse? I used to cover Doc when he was with the Clippers and I was on, on travel with the team for three years. And it's just that hoarse voice that's constant all the time. Do you like want to give him something to kind of like make his throat like a little like wet a little bit so it doesn't sound so hoarse? Uh, you know, that's Doc. And that's how I've always known Doc. You know, I, I was a kid growing up admiring him, you know, as a coach. So this is like a dream come true to be able to, you know, play, uh, play under him. And but I think the biggest thing that he's preached uh, for us on this championship run is to believe. You have to believe that you are that. You have to believe that you are going to be the last team standing and you have to work like that. And, you know, I think Doc has had to work his whole career. So how coaching and playing. So I, I think, you know, the, the, the words that he's preaching to us are instilling that confidence in us and teaching us, you know, over the course, it's not going to be, you know, a, a grand slam home run. This is every day of slowly building up to get to that point, to be ready to compete, um, you know, for a championship. And uh, I think we use the season as that to continue to build. And you realize that, you know, those close games that you're playing in uh, during the regular season, they matter because um, having those good habits, having those championship habits, those winning habits on and off the floor that help you win those close games are the same habits that help you win uh, in the playoffs. And also know you have an invaluable asset uh, as an assistant coach in Sam Cassell. I love me some Sam Cassell. That's a great guy, man. I know he works with the guards a lot. But uh, I want to talk more about you. Uh, the minivan. Like, when I when I think of nicknames, I bang, bang, yeah, I like that. Don't get me wrong. But where did the minivan come from? Um, you know, I, I would say it's maybe like self-proclaimed. When I was in Utah, uh, I wasn't in the rotation, but they subbed me in against the Brooklyn Nets, and I had an opportunity to go up and dunk it. And it didn't really look that pretty. So when I got to the locker room, Joe Ingles was like, man, like, what the heck? Donovan Mitchell, like, all was like, what the heck was that? And I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. Like, I know I'm not a Ferrari like the rest of you guys. I'm more like a minivan. I need a couple laps around the block before I get to full speed. And then our sideline reporter was like, "It was." this is when people are allowed in the locker room. And she was like, oh, minivan, I like that. And then they kind of ran on with it. And then we kind of did this joke with the team where it's like, it's kind of like my logo now. It's me with my head out of a minivan, uh, you know, waving to people. So it's, it's it's been a joke for a while, but it, it's kind of stuck with me. A, a minivan is safe, man. It's got that sliding door. It's good for kids, you know? Yeah, I mean, you know, it, it, seriously, it, it's you get from point A to point B. It's safe. And guess what? The number one thing, what George Nying is, reliable. Reliable. I'll, I'll show up and I'll, I'll do my thing. Efficient and reliable. I like that. You know, and, and, and just, are you still single, George? <laughs> yeah. Yes, I am. This, this is that kind of interview, man. I don't know. We can cut it if we have to or whatever. They're talking to No, talk. no, I'm single. Yeah. yeah. So you know, you're a good looking dude, man. Like, you know, just, you know, you know, very secure in who I am or whatever. So, like, what, what's it like being, you know, on this team? You got a lot of exposure, going on the road, hanging out, different cities or whatever. What What's that process like for you? Um, You know, the biggest thing for me is, uh, you know, uh, during the season, I like to be dialed in and focused. And obviously there's time to have your fun. Um, and I definitely do like to enjoy myself. Um, but at the same time, you don't want to juggle too much um, <laughs> at, uh, at, at one time during an NBA season, because that's how you end up having a season where you're, you have the highest of highs and then the lowest of lows. So if you can kind of be neutral, um, with that being said, uh, when I was younger in my career, distractions were something that, you know, I, I could I could see my game kind of, you know, tail off when, mm. you let, when you're letting those things get the best of you. And uh, I've been in the league seven years now. Um, so the temptation of all that is, you know, kind of in the rearview mirror. 
I mean, mm -hmm. obviously, like I said, everybody likes to have a good time, but at the same time, you know, like my mom always said, you do have to grow up, George. So, um, you know, like I said, there is temptation, but I think it's our job. And I think a lot of us know how we play and are affected, whether if it's by women partying, you know, staying up late, not having a good routine. And uh, I've learned my lesson with uh, all of those things. So uh, I think the biggest thing for me is I'm dialed in, whether if it's on the road and in Philadelphia, I have a, a nice big home that I can spend quality time and get some good sleep in. Yeah, some good quality sleep. Like your mom said, man, keep it in the rear view mirror of the minivan. There you go, man. Like that. Um, and when you go on a date, though, do you pick them up in the minivan or do you, you drive something else? I mean, that would be really fun. I think you should do that if you go on a date. No, I, 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 you didn't know what I do. I show up in a horse, uh, a horse in like buggy or like a carriage and pick them oh. up. It's like we got horses that bring us around the city, you know, real romantic guys. So, you know, ladies, you know, real, real romantic man right here. There you go, man. The Renaissance man right there. All right, I'm going to play a game with you, man. I'm going to stay with the theme of the minivan, the automobile theme. I'm going to name one of your teammates. And what would be their automobile-related nickname? And you tell me why. All right? So you're the minivan. What would Joel MB be? Oh, he would have to be, I would say... What would be like a a stylish, like big, like truck, like something that's so big but can smooth is smooth and is enough to like maneuver around? I would have to say uh, we'd have to. I, I'm not I'm not good with cars, but uh -huh. I would maybe a a Dodge Ram. Like those are sleek and yeah. And, I, I, I think like a Range Rover, still stylish, but at the same time gets the job done. Got a lot of horse. Yeah, there power. we go. There we Looks go. Good, yeah. you know, it's it's top notch, top quality. I like the nice top of the line Range Rover right there. I'm gonna give you one more. Uh, James Harden. He's definitely a Rolls Royce. Oh, the Rolls Royce. Okay. Yeah. Smooth. Upright, smooth. Um, very stylish. There's there's a lot of smoothness, you know, to the car, to his game, for sure. Who, 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 who's this, who's overall, who's the smoothest guy on your team? Like not off the off the court, not just on the court. I want to go off the court. Who's who's the smoothest guy on your team? The guy off that the court, everybody guy gives off, a little a little crap to. Off the court or on the court? Off the court. Hmm. I would say like smoothest as in like dressing. I would have to say probably PJ Tucker. Oh, really? What makes him yeah. what makes him so smooth? In, I mean, uh, I don't know if you've ever heard about the amount of shoes that he has, but he has like a whole house that's like full of shoes. It's, the locker room is full of PJ shoes. Oh, wow. He, he's, he's got some swag to him. Yeah, I mean, you, you would think with a name like PJ, maybe he could start a pajama line or something like that, not the shoes. But I like that. Okay, the shoes, I like that PJs. That's cool. Uh, what about you? What's your guilty pleasure? What, what, what is your, you know, besides, you know, <laughs> Being focused, locked in, being reliable. What is what is George Niang's guilty pleasure? I love to golf, so it's tough in Philadelphia in the winter because uh, you know that ain't a guilty pleasure, man. That's like what everybody does. Tim, come on, man. Let's gonna keep. We're gonna keep it real. One thousand, man. Light skin and light skin. Come on, bro. What is George Niang's uh, guilty pleasure? Man, guilty pleasure. I mean, I like to try out new restaurants. I mean, I, people think that like I should have like this quirky thing, but like. The only quirky thing I really is I like like watching like something that's seamless and like I can ease my mind is I love like watching like war documentaries or like crime shows or narcos where it's just like I don't have to think I can just watch and just enjoy uh, what's going on. I like I live such a simplistic life because honestly, if I lived a crazy life, I'd be all over the place and not successful. Um, so I, I'm like super simple. It's almost like people think that I'm not going to be boring, but <laughs> I've, I've gotten into podcasting. Uh, I love to, I love to get to know other people. I love to have conversations. I would, you could say that's my guilty pleasure. I mean, uh, I don't know. I'm a, I'm a real simplistic dude, to be honest with you. Okay. So is there anything you want to know about me? I mean, you know, your podcast, you like to like, you know, I mean, I, I'm very simpl simplistic guy, but I'm pretty sure, you know. Yeah. Well, at the end of the day, I mean, I think I'd like to know what what is your guilty pleasure and what are what are things that you like to do or you like to do when you're on the road traveling with the Clippers? 
uh, when I was on the road, <laughs> when I was single. <laughs> Here we go. Now we're on another know, camera, huh? <laughs> you don't like when the flames on your feet now, huh? Hey, I like it. Hey, all right. I don't mind. I wrote a whole book called Open Mic, bro. So I'm very open. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I partake in a lot of things that probably got me in a lot of trouble back in the day. But, uh, you know, my guilty pleasures were, believe it or not, what's crazy is I was actually into reality shows, ratchet reality shows, until I actually had to do a reality show. They ain't, they ain't really reality. It ain't really reality. It ain't really, the what you think is real, it ain't really reality. It's a lot of scripted drama that's pretty much what it is so i was into that i was my but now i'm like i guess i'm like you george i'm kind of like just want to stay at home and just be you know live a nice little boring life but you're not boring you're not boring you're still young you still got a lot no, of to live, my brother for sure but i think people have to understand is like from the outside looking in you're like you have all this money you have all this access to so many people and like you should be doing things and yes when i first had access to all this i was doing all the things and then you realize is that when you trying to do all these things, you're trying to be something that you're not. And mm -hmm. you end up chasing your tail and exhausting yourself trying to be something you're not. And you're like, why don't I just be me? Because that's what I'm best at. And you end up falling into like appreciating some of the most simple things ever. Like after a game, I cannot tell you how excited I am to just come back from 18,000 person arena to just sitting at home with me and my buddies conversating and just having it like calm. So what are those conversations like? When you come home, what kind of conversations do you have? Do you talk about basketball? Do you talk about life? What do you talk about politics? Oh, politics? I mean, I'm a basketball like fanatic. Like I, whether it's girls basketball or, you know, college basketball or the other NBA or overseas that my friends playing overseas. It's just, I'm constantly watching it. It's just something that I've always loved. And, you know, it's, it's I'm, I'm addicted. I mean, so I really enjoy just having open conversations pretty much about anything, whether it's life, drama in other people's life, because I try to keep drama out of mind. Um, but um, never no. marry reality show star. If you, <laughs> did, you make, did you make that mistake? I, I wouldn't call it a mistake. I call it a life lesson that I'll never make again. <laughs> that I learned from. Oh, I it's a it. life lesson, but no, it's cool. We're still cool. We're still cool. We're still. Let me stop because that's going to go viral. Let yeah, me stop. That's good. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, final question before I let you go, man. All right, so you love basketball. You still got a long NBA career left. And you should play as long as you want to. But if you weren't playing basketball, what would George Niang be doing? And what do you see life after basketball being like? Um, You know, I've uh, been lucky enough to have family members that are successful in other um, professions. Uh, my uncle's been pretty successful in real estate, which I've gotten into with the financial freedom that I've been, you know, given by playing basketball. Um, so that's something that after basketball, I definitely would want to pursue and continue to be involved in. Not the everyday realtor, but, you know, investing in real estate and different, you know, buildings and, you know, companies. Um, so that's definitely something that, you know, I'm interested in. Um, at the end of the day, if I didn't play basketball, uh, you know, I'm always talking, laughing. So I would wonder if, you know, maybe acting would, would be something that, you know, I would be into. I would say a musician, but my mom like pleads with me to not sing. Like I'll be singing in the car and she'll stop the car and be like, will you please just shut up? So I think, uh, I think, yeah, and the moms always, you know, but sometimes, you know, they may not be, be able to appreciate the newer music. You know, maybe she was into Smokey or Marvin Gaye or maybe Prince back in the day or Michael OJs. Jackson. The OJs. It's something new, man. I, I We believe in you around here, man, at, at the Players Platform, man. So I, I, we need you right now to show off your skills, George. Just a couple of bars, just a couple of notes, of anything you want to sing right arms now. Arms are sweaty, knees weak, arms are heavy. There's vomit on a sweater already. Mom spaghetti. <laughs> okay. Yeah, well, maybe mom is right. I'm just saying. You know, <laughs> <laughs> hey, Mike, Mike so, you just, you just walk, walk, walk me down and, and, and shoot me over, huh? No, but it was like, that was Eminem from back in the day, man. I'm like, okay, it was like, that was cool, though. Like, mom, that was good. I like that. I enjoyed it. But I thought maybe it was going to be like a little sultry, you know what I'm saying? It's, uh, it's cool. Uh, no, they know. Well, I know you say I'm light skinned, but that lover boy stuff. Come on now. All right, no, so no, no Drake, no Drake there, no Drake there. I got you, my man. Good stuff, bro. 
George, hey, man, it's been a pleasure talking to you, man. I really appreciate you. Good luck the rest of the season. Definitely rooting for you guys. Like I said, Doc and Sam, my boys, man. And uh, I really feel like this is your year, man. I appreciate it. We're going to make it happen. All right, my brother. We'll talk soon.